Hello, my name is Maria Dushkova, and today I present Alexandra Whitney, who will talk about her project, doing mathematics while not liking it at first. So uh, the name is Mathachism, appropriately, and it is a series of posts, a series of articles, and uh, a prospective book. So uh, this is a part of the Math Future online event series where we invite people who do interesting, innovative things, who make mathematical future happen. So that describes our guest today. And uh, tell me, Alexandra, just talk, talk about your project. How did you get started? What made you go there? OK. Well, here's the thing. So um, when I was a little girl, I was very interested in science. Um, and however, I was did not have a lot of confidence in mathematics. I, I didn't, I wasn't bad at mathematics, but I was a little perfectionist. And so if I didn't get an A in mathematics, I thought I was bad at mathematics, even though I was getting a B. Um, and so this sort of started really getting, uh, unpleasant for me when I, I was about 12 years old and in middle school in my sixth grade. Uh, that's when I decided, just, I just decided that I was terrible at mathematics, even though, again, I kept getting these. Um, I was just bad. It was not my thing. And I'd been writing. I'd been a writer for a long time. I'd started writing poetry and little stories and things. And I thought, okay, well, I have to decide because, you know, you have to be a writer or you have to be a math person. You can't be both. And then also, I should probably tell you about my background. I, I'm a Swedish uh, citizen. My parents are Swedish, and I was born there. But my father had an international job, so we moved to a lot of different countries. So I lived in Scotland. I lived in Italy. I lived in Mexico. And then I moved to the United States when I was 15 years old. And when I made this decision in sixth grade, I was living in Mexico. And Mexico, um, well, Living in Mexico, this was in the 1980s, was, you know, the tradi very traditional roles for women and men. And basically, the messages coming at me were that math and science were really not for girls. Now, I was a little feminist since long before that, but somehow, even as I was getting all, you know, girls can do anything, for some reason, I did not absorb the message that girls can do math. And it didn't help that my family, while great, were never much into school. My mother was um, not treated very well in school. She was basically, she grew up in the 50s, you know, 40s and 50s, and she was essentially trained to be a housewife and a hostess. And so she never felt very confident with her intellect. And so, and she and I never had a lot in common for all kinds of reasons. But what we had in common became our mutual fear of math. And so, I went through school, even though I loved science, the problem is for science is you need math. You need to be able to speak the language of math, as I call it, to be able to do science. And so as I got older and I got into high school and I started having trouble with math, not because I didn't necessarily understand it, but because I wasn't applying myself and because I was scared of it and because I thought I wasn't good at it. And that started affecting my science. And so by the time I got to college, I sort of half-heartedly tried to study biology one semester, even though I love biology, but there was a lot of math involved, and so I abandoned it. And then I became um, I became a journalist, which actually was probably what I should have done all along because I that is a perfect job for me. But I really wish that I hadn't given up on my science. And so I spent the next decades as a journalist working in a newspaper. And if anyone's ever worked in a newspaper, you'll know that journalists don't like math for the most part. I mean, we are all pretty scared of it. Um, for whatever reasons. And so I left my newspaper in 2008, just right at the Great Recession hit, um, because I wanted to go, to free, go freelance. I was having some health problems. I mean, all kinds of reasons. The newspaper wasn't doing well. So I decided to leave and go freelance. And the ironic thing, of course, is I always loved science. I was always really good with computers, which is silly, because after all, that's math, too. But I didn't, you know, I didn't think that way. So. I was thinking, I don't want to hire some extremely expensive designer to do a web page for myself, because I, I used to teach myself to code, and so I can do HTML coding again. So I went to a community college near me, 
that has um, computer classes so that I can learn to design myself a nice web page through, you know, various software, you know, Adobe and all that stuff. And so I saw that there was a page with a math department, and I saw that they offered classes from high school as far back as pre-algebra. And I sort of had this impulse. I thought, you know, I know I'm bad at math, but I've always sort of felt in the back of my head that I was wrong, that maybe I wasn't bad at math. And I thought, you know what, I'm taking this design class already. Why don't I just go ahead and sign up for pre-algebra? And then I thought, you know what, what the hell? I'm a freelancer. My time is my own. I'm going to just take as many classes as I can. I'm going to write about it. I'm going to be sort of the universal student here. And it was a lot of, it was very difficult because, you know, just going in and, and just facing this, this thing that I feared for such a long time. And very luckily for me, the first teacher I had was just wonderful. He was um, a, a fellow from Nigeria who was an engineer, I guess, in his spare time. And he um, was very good at teaching mathematics. And he just did it as a hobby, or, well, he did it to make some extra cash. But he's such an amazing teacher. And I'm really kind of sorry that he's not a full-time professor. He would be amazing. But he kind of made me realize that this wasn't something that I couldn't do, that I could, that I had perfect, you know, not perfect, but I, I could understand it. And so luckily for me, I had this man in the first class, and I did really well. I got an A in that class, the first A I'd gotten probably since elementary school in mathematics. And then I went on and said, okay, well, gosh, I'm going to do this again. So I took algebra and, again, got an A. It was wonderful. And by that time, I had enough confidence, and I'd really gotten to love math, that I realized how silly it was for me and how much time I'd wasted fearing math and feeling like I couldn't learn it. And, and it was just a very interesting transformation, and it was really just a good reminder that sometimes the worst enemies are ourselves and our attitudes towards what we can do. I mean, certainly there are things, many things I can't do physically, um, but mentally I think we often set up blocks for ourselves that really aren't there. And unfortunately, a lot of people in society reinforce those blocks with attitudes about what we, what an individual, depending on their class or their gender or their race, what they can do. And so that's kind of my experience with these classes kind of pushed me to saying, to asking more questions. And again, I'm being a journalist here, not an academic or a math teacher or anything. I'm just a journalist because we ask questions. And I started asking these questions like, how did this happen? Why, why do we, so many of us feel this way? Why is the system like this? What's going on? And that's basically become the whole basis for this, the book project, that's still an unnamed book project. It's not going to be masochism, unfortunately, but um, I really just want to kind of get an idea, and that's why also I'm talking to people, including you, Maria, I, I'm talking to you because I want to get an idea from different people what they think is the reason and what we can do, and to get all these ideas about what we can do about this to make sure that, I mean, not everybody's going to be studying, you know, advanced calculus, but I'd be really happy if we could get everybody one step closer to numeracy and that we can get everybody one step closer to stop complaining about having to calculate a tip at dinner because that really irritates me now. So essentially that's how it all started and how it's continuing. But it was just, I mean, again, it was kind of an impulse, but it was born of, from a long time of kind of questioning really in the back of my head and regretting the decisions that I've made. And that essentially is how it happened. It was sort of like, oh, well, I have this opportunity. I'm going to try. So, yeah. It's really fascinating. As a math education person, I get to hear a lot of what I call grief stories. People basically mm -hmm. come to me, and um, they need a hug. And sometimes they cry and they say, um, I'm, I'm happy you're laughing, <laughs> as opposed to that. But people, people... Otherwise I will cry. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, people say, let me, Maria, let me tell you all about what happened to me in third grade. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes it goes back several generations, like your story. Mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah. So it's definitely the question, the powerful question you ask, why? Why are we doing it to ourselves and to our children? And mm -hmm. uh, what happens? How can we stop? And uh, if, uh, what forces um, are there that stop us or maybe just the circumstances that make it happen? That's really the heart of the matter, and I would very much like to continue this conversation with the mass future community that we have and with the natural mass community uh, that includes more parents in it, because yeah. uh, I think parents, especially par parents of girls right now as it stands, but all parents need to hear this question and to ponder yeah. it. What is it happening? Why is it happening? And you are an, a journalist, you are an, an investigator, so you are in a very yeah. good position to dig up some answers for us all. Well, well, that's the thing, it's interesting, the way I'm positioning this is, is I, I'm i not, you know, some a researcher, I mean, well, I'm a researcher, but I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of those genius mathematicians types. I'm just, you know, basically your average lady who decided to learn math. Um, and to me, not that, I, I'd like to talk to those genius mathematicians essentially and say, you know, share your secret, what's going on here, you know, or, or the educators and say, what, what do you see in the classrooms, what do you think we can do? And there are actually, I mean, and you've seen this too, I'm sure, is there are quite a lot of people around the world who are trying to solve this problem and are doing it in different ways. And some of them are obviously more effective than others. And I'd like to, I'm trying to sort of highlight which ones are the really effective ways, even then thinking, um, I mean, I, I grew up in a very, well, a more unusual way than most people because I lived all over the world and I was in different, I mean, I, I went through four different school systems in three different languages. I've been to both public and private school. I mean, I've been all over the place. So I'm just interested because in, people talk a lot, especially in this country, and I'm sure you've heard about this, this whole idea of Singapore math and how wonderful it is. Um, and I, I don't dispute that it's a great system. It's just I wonder from a cultural point of view whether we need to, we, we can just put one culture's solution on top of another culture's solution. And I think, you know, some people have a tendency to just want one solution and we're just going to apply that and, you know, whereas I think it's more complicated than that. This um, is a very, very powerful, very strong and also um very difficult message for people that yes I know. we can <laughs> we can there are some things in the world we can optimize like yes. um if we produce uh, plastic there is this one chemical process that makes the production the best and yes. once we discover it, we can just do it all over the world and we'll have that plastic made in the most efficient, uh, cheapest, fastest way. And right. uh, it's just simply not like that in complex systems, in um, ecology, in culture, in education, even mathematics okay. education. There may be uh, one good way to solve a quadratic equation, but there is mm -hmm. just not a single best way to teach the quadratic equation. <laughs> well, exactly. And I mean, what's interesting, one thing I, you know, people always talk about, oh, math is great because usually there's only one answer. Well, everyone who has factored an equation a polynomial knows that, you know, it can have two answers, a negative and a positive answer. Um, so the idea that there's only one answer in math is untrue as well. Um, so, yeah, I just find it interesting. People get very simplistic about their solutions. And I guess part of the project I'm looking into is just saying, okay, here's this solution, here's this solution, here's this solution, here's, I mean, presenting a number of solutions and talking to these people who are going through this and saying, you know, just so that we sort of have an idea of the options, um, not so much saying this is the only way, you know, but I mean, if anything, just to sort of keep the discussion going and move it forward. Um, so that's what I'm hoping to do, which is, you know, obviously a little bit more than just me going back and, you know, getting over my fear of the quadratic equation, <laughs> although I think you, I may still fear it a little bit. So. You have a bigger quest there. And I do. It is a bigger quest, definitely. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, it's right maybe, on. It may be, you know, it may be very Don Quixote, but whatever. I'm going to try. <laughs> Oh, well, uh, the, the times changed. We now have many more images of quests being done playfully. Uh, so yeah. maybe it's Don Quixote, or maybe it's World of Warcraft with millions right. and millions of followers. <laughs> exactly. No, but I find it interesting. I mean, like I said, I've, I've grown up in many different cultures um, with different attitudes toward mathematics. Um, and it's funny, because I started my education in Italy as a child. That's the first school I, I learned mathematics in. And I've since come to find out that Italy's a, a attitude toward mathematics, especially women doing mathematics, is very different from the attitude that we have in the United States. Um, there are far more women who are in mathematics, or at least, well, okay, according to a study from 2005, which is, I know is a long time ago, but I'm hoping the trend has held somewhat. Um, the two countries in Europe with the highest number of female mathematicians and female um, math professors are Portugal and Italy, or at least they were then. I don't know if that's changed since then, but I thought it was a really interesting idea because when I lived in Italy, especially when I grew up in the 70s and 80s, um, women's rights were really not like a huge thing. <laughs> Um, it wasn't, I can't even call it even now, I can't really say, you know, Italy's some big feminist country. Um, but, you know, Sweden, which is where I'm from, their gender gap in mathematics is a lot bigger than Italy's. So, to me, it's like, again, we're talking about complex solutions. That I think we can look at what, what is Italy doing right in encouraging girls and women to study math? And what are they doing wrong? And what is Sweden doing right? And what are they doing wrong? And so, like you said, there's just not... It would be interesting for me, I, I'm kind of looking at this multiculturally, like, what does it come down to? And you talked about optimizing. And one thing I found very interesting, I've been reading the work of a woman named Carol Dweck up at Stanford University. And she's a psychologist, actually. And she did some really interesting things. Right around the time when I gave up on math, she, she was looking at classrooms for little children where, who are not good math performers. And she found that just telling the kids, look, you can do this, it made a huge difference. Because the minute the kids stopped thinking it was some sort of thing that they had to be geniuses to learn or they had to have some natural talent, they actually started trying. And they did really well. And I found that, I just found that absolutely fascinating because if somebody had come and told me when I was 12 years old, look, just because you're getting a B doesn't mean you can't learn this, that you're not good at this. That would have made an enormous difference for me because Ironically, I was getting B's in English, and I was getting B's in those subjects that I thought I was good at. But that never stopped me from becoming a writer, getting a B in English. But getting a B in math made me give up on that. So what was going on there? Um, and that's, again, another thing I, I kind of want to explore. So that's what I mean. It's very complicated. But I think by just everybody getting into the conversation and discussing the issue, that maybe we can get a better idea of, of of some of the things we can try, you know? It's very so. interesting that you mention uh, Carol Dweck's studies and uh, the yeah. whole area of expertise on messages we send to our children. Yeah. And with messages, it's not just what we say, of course, it's what we do and what uh, the culture does. And I wonder if um, they have some better messages in Italy. <laughs> Maybe, or some uh, in some of those countries where there are more female mathematicians. Uh, so some messages are hidden. Like for example, in the U.S., your chances of um, well having uh, of reproducing are severely reduced if you go into STEM field. It's mm -hmm. just a statistical fact. But people sense it. I interviewed girls as young as, as 13. They talk about it already. Mm -hmm. They talk about, well, they don't use the word chances of reproduction. They mm -hmm. just say, oh, I sort of want to have a family. I don't know how that will work out if I become an engineer oh, or yeah, yeah. a mathematician. So the messages, uh, but, but some of it is about a cultural attitude. So one big one, like you said, you can't succeed if you work at it. It's not about ability. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big one here. And it, uh, it can be um, painful 
if you think it's about ability and fail. It means well, that's it for you. You are done. So exactly, and because I think that's that's a big problem in this country. I mean, I'm not saying when I say this country, I mean the United States, the dominant culture in the United States, because there are places where that is not the attitude, um, and those people are doing really well. But because the overwhelming culture, the overwhelming cultural message is that, I mean, it's a lot to fight against. You know, it just to say, look, just try it. I mean. You know, it's happened to the best. Well, it's happened to me. You know, I, I believed it until I finally, I finally tried, and I realized, well, this is stupid. Why was I thinking that? You know, so it's just again, it, it, I mean, we're talking about. I, I haven't so much. I've actually, I would like to speak to more women in mathematics in Italy if I can. I'm going to try, but um, I was speaking to an Iranian woman because you know the first woman to win the Fields Medal was is Iranian up at Berkeley now, um, and I'm. I know you were trying to pronounce my last name, and I certainly don't want to mess up hers. So, but I know when I was talking to various um, Iranian women that I know, they were not surprised at all that that this woman got this prize, because they said that even though education is segregated, you know the girls and boys don't go to school together, the level of expectations of girls in STEM and math are just as high as the boys, and the girls get very good training. They're never told, oh, you can't do this because you're a girl, which is why until very recently, you know, Iran, they cracked down the universities, limited women from certain majors. I mean, I saw there was like 60% of STEM majors up until that time, was 2011 or 12, I believe, um, were women, even though after that, I mean, they didn't necessarily go into STEM, but they majored in it. And But a lot of the, the women I've talked to who are engineers, um, my dentist, um, you know, they say, well, no, it's, we never got the message that girls can't do math. We were just told we should just do it, and, you know, and you better apply yourself and keep going. And I, I found that very interesting, you know. So, again, as I was saying, just because a country has certain, you know, gender, like a gender, more gender equality than another, doesn't necessarily mean that the women in that country are going to be open to the notion of learning math. And this, so I'd like to just, you know. This yeah. brings me back to what you were discussing with programs, like how there is not a single program that will yeah. probably, it's more like a quilt uh, patchwork, that uh, yeah. each patch will work for a minority, but together it will cover everyone. And it's interesting exactly. that even by countries, uh, there is probably not a single thing that categorizes Iranian, uh, Iranian women mathematicians um, uh, or people from Italy, people from Iran, people from Bulgaria, some of those countries where uh, there are more female mathematicians. Uh, right. But they probably have some sort of subcultures, uh, some sort of strata, social, uh, social layers <laughs> where yeah, uh, support happens within families, within friends, yeah. and that brings me to um, uh, to another question: What sort of uh, tribes or groups, maybe smaller than countries, you found uh, that were relevant to your questions, to to your big quest? About well, here's well, interesting. So, you know, when the book, when I first started thinking about doing some sort of book about this. Um, I really just was going to focus entirely on the women, you know, the issue of women and, and math. But like I said, I've, I've decided to broaden it a little bit more because I do think it's, while women are 50% of the population, I, I still think, you know, there are a lot of boys and men out there who, who, who should, you know, become fluent as well. Um, and But when I was doing this research, I spoke to a lot of women in STEM. I spoke to aerospace engineers, I spoke to planetary scientists, I spoke to material scientists, of course I spoke to mathematic, uh, mathematicians, I spoke, I mean, I think I, I mean, I interviewed about two dozen, which is not a huge, 24, which is not a huge amount, but I mean, I just got started before the night sort of, then I kind of went into a different direction, but one thing I found very interesting talking to all these women was that the majority of them, um, I mean, the vast majority of them had two of three things. They had a supportive teacher who really at some point, some crucial point in their education, pointed out to them that this was something that they should do. They had 
a parent or a relative who was really pushing them and saying, no, this is ridiculous, of course you can do this. And then they also had a certain um, comfort with math from the very beginning. Um, the thing is, though, with the comfort, again, that can serve, I mean, they saw it as ability. And I mean, I'm not saying there is no such thing as, you know, that math isn't an ability. I think it is. It's just the attitude we have right now is that math is an ability that cannot, you know, that it's just you either have it or you don't. I don't think that's true. I think you can train it. Um, I mean, I just my, on my, in my own um, experience, I mean, I went from, you know, getting confused over negative signs to, you know, taking derivatives and, you know, and, and all this other, and integrating things. So, I mean, you know, if I can do it, uh, I think a lot more people can. Um, but it was interesting with all these women, they had two of those three. And each of those things supported them. So, now one woman had um, a mother who was a math teacher. And her mother insisted that her daughter, she saw that her daughter had an affinity for numbers and she, or liked numbers, and decided to put her in this class that was a special math class. And, you know, pushed her to stay in it, pushed her to keep going. And even though this woman, she had been a math teacher, she was really good at it, but this was the 50s, so the minute she got pregnant, she basically got shut out of her job and became, you know, a full-time stay-at-home mom. Um, but that didn't stop her from making sure that her daughters would be able to do this. And so she pushed this, this my, my, my interview subject. And this woman wound up becoming an aerospace engineer. She's a faculty member at a massive university. And her mother always fought for her. And whenever she's saying to her mom, oh, I don't get it, or I'm confused, and she said, no, 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 you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. And then she also said that she had several teachers, especially at the university level, because she was one of the few engineering students. She, she was the first woman, one of the first women to get, to get a degree at Caltech, um, which is impressive. And she basically, you know, it was hard because she was one of the few women there. And so the professors she had, she, she found mentors, essentially, and her teachers and professors. She had her mom. And so that was the case with her. That was the case with another woman who was, in this, this case, it was her sister, her older sister, who was really pushing her to, you know, get over it and get through it and so on. And then she found a teacher. And so to me, those, again, that was the majority of the injuries I had had two of those three factors that they didn't necessarily credit for their success, but that as I kind of started drawing it out of them, I, I noticed they fit a pattern. Now, I know 24 isn't, you know, I mean, I'd love to do even way more, more than that, but I've also looked at, for example, a very famous example, Marie Curie. Her father was a huge champion of hers, and her sister, she, her sister became a doctor. Other, um, you know, going really far back in history, Hypatia, her father was, um, you know, head of the library and really pushed his daughter. And at that point, it was not fathers, but it's also mothers now, especially these days when women's roles have opened up, that they usually had a parent or a relative who really pushed them, and then they had a teacher to encourage them. And so that seems to be a, a really good formula <laughs> um, to, like, almost like a plastic formula, I guess, <laughs> to produce somebody is that, which is why parents need so much to be on board, you know, with their children's, not just their daughters, but their children's education. And I mean, if my, I mean, I, I, I you know, my mother had her own issues, I've realized, but this happened where she, the year I gave up on math, um, I was still doing fine in the class. And I guess her, the teacher told her during one of our, the parent-teacher conferences that, I was actually not bad at math and that I should stop saying that I was. Unfortunately, the teacher didn't tell me. He told my mother. And my mother, for whatever reason, didn't tell me. I don't know. She may have gotten distracted. She may have forgotten. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure it was not a malicious thing in any way. But the thing is, had she told me that, you know, Mrs. So-and-so thinks that you should stop saying that and so on, the difference would have been tremendous for me. Um, it was just one of those little moments that would have really made a difference because then I would have felt comfortable going to my teacher and saying, hey, I'm having some issues with this. Can you help me? You know what I mean? I would have felt more comfortable raising my hand in class. Um, they're just, again, it's one of those things where, where if you're a parent, you really need to be careful not to discourage, I mean, obviously, that's parenting in general, but especially for subjects like math or science. You need to be very careful not to 
discard your children with it's interesting you know, how how your story goes from okay let's look at some <laughs> curricula well it's not about the curriculum because the things change by adaptation by culture and everything let's look at the yeah. culture well it gets down to families and parents or mentors a lot of it it gets down to what it really does I think they're crucial I mean that's like right the ground level right there micro level importance the, the, I think the, the, the effect the size of the effect of people on children is significantly larger it's much larger and you are it looks like your your findings show that that uh, it's about yeah. people and not mm -hmm. about whatever program you use in algebra in seventh grade or things of that nature. It's uh, right. no, how supportive your yeah. people are. So, and it's interesting, that's a very uh, woman thing to say that it's about people and relationships. But that's yeah. how it works. <laughs> yeah, well, well that's how it's, yeah, I mean, it's interesting, you know, math. math yeah. Uh, no, is about I think that math. Um, well, I mean, that's also kind of what tells me. Yeah. I'm sorry. What? Uh, we just had a bit of lag, but I am all done talking now. I I was just making. Um, I, oh, I was okay. giggling. No, it's it's a it's an internet oh. lag, but I was just giggling basically, <laughs> laughing a little bit. Okay. All right. No, no, it's just, but you're right, I mean, it's funny, too, because um, when I was setting up, the, you know, the, the, the problem, well, I, I've been calling the obstacles to becoming comfortable with mathematics, and, and when I was, you know, talking, I was just, you know, adding all these different obstacles and so on, and I was talking to my agent about it, and she said, now, you're such a journalist, you know, it's like all the bad news, give me some good news, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, I mean, I think the good news is that if people are aware of, Especially parents are aware of, of how much their children are influenced by their attitudes toward mathematics. They can make a difference. Um, and teachers also can make a difference in, obviously, in mentoring children. Or especially if a kid, you know, you can tell the child probably can do this, but lacks the confidence. And I mean, I know these are very difficult things because. I see the classrooms, you know, one teacher has 35 students, you know, they don't have time, they, they, they're exhausted. I mean, you know, there's so many obstacles in the way, but at the same time, sometimes just telling a kid, hey, stop saying you're bad at math, um, you can do this. I mean, again, that just, it makes, it can make all the difference in the world. And so if, I, if any message comes from this, I, I hope the teacher would take that in mind and, you know, when they're not so exhausted and, and, you know, overwhelmed, and I completely understand that they are, but just to remember that, just remember how important their words are as well, I, is something that I have, um, I've been thinking about a lot. I, I think I've heard you sending very optimistic messages by now, so uh, <laughs> you have discovered those good news by now. I am really looking forward to seeing more in your book and your further mm -hmm. articles. But um, I'm going to ask you a question. I, I have two questions yet I want to ask, and one of them is more neutral, but the second one is more about bad news, maybe. Well, the neutral one is, um, or maybe happy one, uh, first. Okay, so do you want good, uh, happy one or the scary one first? <laughs> Oh, whichever one you like. I don't think it's fine either way. Okay. So the first one is about something you said uh, a while ago about uh, one answer and how you, you found things that have multiple answers. And then there are artistic tasks in mathematics that have infinitely many answers. How do you represent yes. uh, something artistically? Or tasks like how do you pose a question? And you can pose mm -hmm. infinitely many different questions. That's a mathematical task, but it doesn't have a single answer. So, and that leads me to the more general question. So, on your, as you were going through your quest, through your journey with this project, yes. how did your understanding of what mathematics is uh, progress and develop? Because you probably now think of mathematics 
differently from before of what it even is? Did it change? Yes. Okay. Well, like like this, yes, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, it did change. Uh, one thing that really changed for me, and I mean, that change kind of came along pretty quickly, was first of all this idea that I didn't, you know, for a lot of people say, oh, well, why do I need algebra? I'm never going to use it again, you know. I realized how much I use mathematics every day. And when I say out of mathematics, I mean, I, I, I said both about trigonometry, you know. I mean, not that I'm, you know, calculating sines and cosines all over the place, but it's more about, you know, the idea of angles and, and things like that. Um, but what also really was the notion, and I mean, we all know about binary code, you know, everything is zeros and ones, but also this notion that pretty much everything you see can be turned into an equation um, was fascinating to me. You know, that that wave, that, you know, the waves in the water, the, the sunlight. Um, I mean, it was a really interesting way of thinking of everything just suddenly boiling down to this mathematical universe. And that was something I thought about, and I realized as I, I mean, and again, I've only taken up to calculus, so I haven't gone beyond as I know that I'm basically, you know, it's, if I were in an orchestra, I'd, you know, I'd be, I'd be playing a very, very simple instrument. And I know that there are much more complicated instruments out there that make the sound much fuller. I mean, I'm, I'm basically beating on a drum with the stuff that I've done so far in mathematics. But it made me aware of the fact that, as far as mathematics is concerned, if I may torture this metaphor any further, it made me aware that, <clears throat> there's a big old orchestra out there and there's so much more going on, uh, which was really interesting. But while I realized that, <clears throat> I also didn't want to discount the importance of that one instrument and how important that sound was and how it was a part of it all. And so, yeah, I mean, I think of mathematics as something a lot broader in a way. I was having a discussion, this was my, my calculus teacher, about how <clears throat> at the highest level of mathematics, it really starts getting very mystical, um, which makes sense because when you really think about it, when a Pythagoras, if you're going to go back, you know, 4,000 years or so, uh, or actually, well, not 4,000 years, but like 2,500 years, he um, he and his cult worshipped numbers. You know, they saw the God in numbers. And that's something that I think we've really gotten away from. Not that we should turn numbers into religion necessarily, but it's that idea of, seeing something mystical in numbers. Um, but I think a lot of the pure mathematicians in many ways are philosophers as well, although they probably would come after me with pitchforks for saying that. But then again, this one professor I had was really into pure mathematics, said she enjoyed philosophy greatly because of her math background. And so that is kind of how my view has changed. And I know it's not just about <clears throat> counting things or measuring things or whatever, but there's something a lot bigger going on. Um, and, of course, that whole lot bigger going on is what helps us, you know, in science and in uh, technology and in, I mean, even in things like art and music and everything else. But, again, this notion, it was a very, very cool idea for me that um, it wasn't just about adding one and two. It, it was something a lot bigger. So, yeah, so that's how my attitude towards math changed. I, I gained a much bigger appreciation for what it really can be. How interesting, so the two, so you named quite a few things, but the two that stood out to me was that um, mathematics is everywhere, kind of, in waves mm -hmm. and trees, and you can, it's not confined to little numbers <laughs> in addition, no, exactly. it's everywhere. And the second big one looks like for you is that mathematics is a way of looking at life in general, it's a philosophy of life. And people yeah. may or may not see it this way, but it has a meaning and significance at large. Yeah. It's not very yeah, rigid, that is, yeah. but it has a large significance to it. But see that, which I think is, is kind of is one of the problems is that because so many of us don't understand or don't realize that, we, you know, we minimize the importance of mathematics. Uh, whereas, you know, with, when you read or, you know, literature and everything, like people see the, the poetry and the philosophy in, in, in literature, but they need to also understand that it's in mathematics. And I think if more people realize that, I think more of us will be comfortable with all this.
it's interesting, there is a movement called humanistic mathematics that sees mathematics as one of the humanities and uh, tries to make it more of um, appreciated uh, uh, art. Uh, but um, I wanted to kind of poke at one of your metaphors because I love that one. And uh, a, a lot of people now use music as a metaphor for mathematics performing mm. uh, and so on, like the Lockhart Lament. You might have seen Lament um, uh, uses that as an expanded metaphor. Um, mm -hmm. But um, it was interesting that you were talking about having a voice in the orchestra and an important sound. And I, I think finding your voice is so, um, it's so important for, well, for women, for anyone who doesn't have a voice necessarily in, in the given culture. Um, yeah. And yet, so I want to ask you because, um, well, a performer in an orchestra is playing someone else's music. Mm -hmm. Have you thought of yourself um, as a composer of mathematics, contributing to it, making it? in some ways, in small ways, on drums or whatever little four-hole flute you doodle, you know, toot on, <laughs> but whatever, whatever, you know, we all have our favorite uh, instruments. Mm -hmm. And so, so the, the com uh, that, that has to do with some of my interests in education. So mm -hmm. have you tried to, to make things? Uh, well, sort of. I mean, I... Have you been invited to make things by your teachers? Because um, when you take a class, algebra or calculus, you can mm -hmm. integrate, but you integrate what people have integrated before. <laughs> oh, yes, yes. But, but I mean, then again, I mean, that, what, why does that even matter? But, you know, it's new to you, so, you know. Oh. I, no, but I have actually done, um, you know, I, and of course, it's because I'm a writer, but I've, I've written little word problems for myself <laughs> just to sort of play around with ideas. Um, How did that feel? Because those my big issues. How did that well, feel? it was interesting because I've always been very frustrated with word problems. And it's ironic because, uh, you know, I'm a writer. So, you know, I, words is my, are supposed to be my thing. And yet word problems make me incredibly anxious and unhappy. So. Um, you know, all these distance problems, you know, one train catches up to another train, et cetera, et cetera. So I was sort of making word problems a bit more interesting for myself by adding intrigue and sort of human interest to them that, you know, for, you know, somebody, you know, one spy is chasing another spy across, you know, this place and, you know, that sort of thing. And to me, it made it more interesting. Um, and it reminded me, actually, I, you know, because I, I said before, I, I never thought of myself as a mathematical person for a very long time, while at the same time I was really into technology and, and you know, I'm, I'm actually, I, I, when I was in my 20s, I learned to fly airplanes and, you know, so I've done a lot of things that include applied mathematics. And I remember I had an econo economics teacher, and I really liked economics too, by the way. I'm, I've, I've never had any problems with, you know, money stuff. Um, but she would make up little economic scenarios and she had a whole long like it was like a soap opera with these characters and you know they betrayed each other and they loved each other and so on and you know I will never forget you know the rules of supply and demand I will never forget things like interest rates because she sort of put them in my head to this extremely amusing soap opera between these characters so I think to that sense that to me that's the kind of composition that I would like to see in the sense that it's um, I guess it also goes back to that notion of the humanist math um, I don't know if you're talking about when you say humanistic math, it, the STEM to STEAM movement, or if that's a separate thing. But it's um, that's the kind of compositions I've been doing is taking math um, applications and sort of putting them in a story. And yeah, that's as far as I've dared to compose. Um, at some point, I'm hoping to be able to go back and sort of do it all at leisure and, and become you know, come up with my own little problems. But no, I have to admit, I haven't done as much as that as I'd like. You know. <laughs> so but it'll be fun. This, this is so fascinating to me because posing problems, of course, is at the heart of mathematics. And so yeah. you you went for that. It's beautiful. And <laughs> how, so you, you said you didn't like other people's word problems. 
Most of them well, are boring, yes. Yeah. Well, they are. I mean, it's just like, you know, this man, he has to build a fence, and he has this many pieces of fence, but he doesn't know how big his property is. I mean, that doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, of course, if you have a piece of property, I mean, it's just like some of them, I mean, I understand they're illustrating a concept, and, and I get it, but, I mean, they have to be grounded in a certain amount of reality, you know? They can be. Um, and I felt like a lot of the time they just, they just aren't. <laughs> they they yeah. can be unrealistic, but I think it's okay to, to do science fiction or fantasy as long as it's interesting and uh, interesting well, to, to, to me, your be story. <laughs> yeah, so, a lot better than sports, you know, a lot of the things, which is weird that we're talking about girls and boys, a lot of math pro word problems involve sports. And also, I don't, I mean, I know lots of girls who like sports, but a lot of them are very male-dominated sports. And so the girls who are not into sports are going to just sort of pass right over that. And that doesn't mean we have to do a story about fairy princesses either. I mean, I think you can do something in between that's not, you know, one thing or, you know, stereotypically another. But, but yeah, no, that's, anyway, <laughs> yeah. So how did you like your problems? Could you solve your own problems? Did you like them? I could. I did. I actually, um, I don't know, it was kind of, so when I was doing this, this is back, you know, that whole scandal with Roman Polanski that happened a while back where, you know, he was taken in Switzerland and, you know, and he uh, he was arrested and all this whole business. And it was one of those things like, you know, had he known that he was going to be arrested, how long would it have taken him to get away and where would he have been at this distance, you know, when the when Interpol would have, you know, like, just like, I mean, it was one of those very sort of, um, just very much of the moment kind of situations, you know, like, I, I mean, I'm not saying it's any, it was a necessarily wonderful taste, but it was one of those things where I take political things of the day or, or culture, pop culture things of the day and sort of turn them into, and that made it a lot easier for me to calculate that, you know. Interpol would have been in Chamonix by the time he was in Zurich or whatever, you know. So it was, it was more like that, really, of just sort of using a current event. Um, so yeah, I really enjoy doing that way more than if you know how many uh, times will the batter hit the bat, you know, the ball in the baseball game for the finals, you know, kind of thing. So it's really it's sort of. I mean, I wouldn't be really bring, yeah. brings me back. So your uh, I can hear the joy in your voice when you even talk about it. Just mention your problems. <laughs> that brings me back to to the, the way you started the conversation with different people just need different things. So you need those problems and people mm -hmm. people who are interested in that will probably enjoy yours like you enjoyed your economic professor's problem. Right. But uh, we, we still we just need the variety. We need to invite people to make their own problems. I mean... So the people yeah. who do them in different, make them in different ways. That's very interesting. So I'm so glad I asked because that just rocks. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> so um, I have a darker question. So brace yourself. I oh. told you earlier. Please bring it on. Okay. So so some people. It's a, it's about social issues. So some people now see the the, the middle jobs, so to speak, go away. So there is still some mm, well lo low level uh, service or um, physical labor with people still you know assemble phones and um, work at cafes. But yeah. there is not much, uh, as much as it used to be 20, 30 years ago, there are not that many jobs for like a solid associate or college degree. There is more up top where, where people are engineers or highly advanced um, researchers or business people, but not something you can train for with a reasonably short uh, kind of college level education and go work. There is this uh, change in the society and uh, it happens ironically at the same time as college education becomes more widely available. Yeah. So some people make a claim that some of those patterns we see in basically our children not being educated well is because there are pressures in the society that there is not needed, there are unneeded people or unneeded professions. 
Yes. So what would we do? Uh, the, the same goals, and uh, I obviously disagree with this reasoning for for my own reasons. But I want I'm asking people that because it bothers me greatly. Uh, the people say, well, we well we can teach everyone calculus, but what's the point? So we we shouldn't even try. And some of these messages that people get, well, calculus is not for you, or even for the likes of you. They are because there is no. The, the reasoning goes there is no place for everyone right, in right. there. What, what, it's not a new reasoning, but there is a new twist on it with the information society versus industrial. What do you say to that? Well, it's interesting you should say that because here's the thing. Um, in, according to the research that I've been doing, this is actually not a new idea. Um, I've been doing this research about, you know, like I said, trying to figure out why do we feel this way about math? And I was looking at the history. I mean, this is I mean, this is specific to the United States, but um, so I mean, it took a very long time for, for the idea that everybody deserved an education at all. I mean, any sort of you know, you had the northern part of this country. I mean, I'm talking about the original 13 colonies right now. The northern part, the Puritans, were very interested in teaching people to read and write and do basic mathematics. Um, they were very much into, especially the reading and writing, because you had to read the Bible, because it, it was literacy as a way to to save your soul. Um, and so they, they, you know, they set up, they even had this thing called the Deluder Satan Act, where um, they thought Satan was going to come into your head if you didn't teach your children to read the scripture and to, you know, count and so on. Um, and so that culture was very pervasive up in, you know, the Massachusetts Bay Colony and a little bit further down. And then you have the southern plantation economy where basically education was just for the richest people. Um, and, and then, you know, there was the whole slave issue where they were not educated for different reasons, or oh, for <laughs> obvious reasons. Um, but even if you were a poor white member of that society, you could not count on a public education. So public education didn't become really a priority in this country until the end of the 19th century. And interestingly enough, mathematics became a part of that as there was this whole idea of mathematics for, you know, me mental gymnastics and sort of, and I mean, not for everyone, mind you, I mean, let's, let's be serious. I mean, you know, certain ethnic groups and, and women of all ethnic groups and also, you know, people from certain socioeconomic backgrounds did not have that kind of universal access to public education. But by the end of the century, it was a lot easier for people in this country of whatever social station to get some education that was free that they didn't have to pay for. But here's the interesting thing is so right around the 20s there were there was a movement, the progressivist movement that started started talking about mathematics and this idea that mathematics was not necessary for a large group of people, like only five percent of the population about, and this is the male population, it's even less women, needed to be taught algebra and geometry. And there was this fellow named William Hurd Kilpatrick who spearheaded this movement. He was, um, he was a, a, well, I guess a disciple of the progressivist, um, oh God, the John Dewey, um, or maybe it wasn't John Dewey, but it was the Dewey that did the whole progressivist movement. And basically, Kilpatrick went around saying, you know, no, this is stupid. We shouldn't be teaching kids algebra and geometry um, because they don't need it. They don't need it. They don't need it. So between 1900 and about 1925, when he was really agitating about this, um, the number of people taking advanced mathematics in high school dropped drastically. And then it's interesting. So then, you know, the whole World War II came along and and Hitler, and then, you know, the Soviet Union, and all the rest of it, and suddenly, you know, there was the whole new math thing, where, oh my God, we need engineers because the Soviet, the communists are going to come get us. And what's interesting is because Kilpatrick had had such, and his followers had had quite the influence, suddenly, you know, we're trying to redo, you know, we're trying to get people interested in, in the mathematics we told them they shouldn't be interested in the first place. And so we've been sort of battling that, and, and this, to me, feels like, a new version of Mr. Kilpatrick's teachings. It's just in this case, it's well, we have an information, you know, technology at the top, and we have, you know, the manufacturing economy has gone overseas. So what's the point? And to that, my answer is, and will always be, that 
mathematics belongs to all of us. And I mean, okay, a kid doesn't have to take calculus, but at least up to trigonometry, I think can be valuable for just for our own intellectual development. And even if you're going to be, you know, if you're even if you're going to be selling oranges on the street, I mean, you know, you need to know how to count those oranges. You need to know how to make change. You need to know, you know, how to figure out supplies and demands. And to me, just that high school level of mathematics is just necessary to live in the extremely complicated world that we live in now. Even, again, even if you are just, you know, picking vegetables or something, I think it's important just to have that knowledge to be able to function because, you know, well, what we're over the It brings, brings us back to your new definition of mathematics as something that gives you a new point of view on the world, the philosophy. Is whatever right. your profession is, you, you are still a citizen and possibly a parent and possibly yeah. a participant in your community. And people yeah. with mathematical points of view can play those roles more powerfully, probably yeah. in some ways. It, it gives you it gives you some powers on parenting, on citizenship, on just understanding the world, the issues. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that, that's a very interesting message uh, to, that's, that's a very strong message. So I have one more question. We are at the end of our hour. Oh. <laughs> wow, oh, okay. to look at the time. Time flies when yes. wonderful things happen. It's been so You're interesting. <laughs> OK, so yes. Time, time flies when you're doing mathematics or making yeah. mathematics, even talking about it. So, yeah. because it's so uh, engaging, um, or it can be, if it's your own. So, oh. <laughs> so um, I, I, I'll ask you the question I ask every presenter who comes to Math Future mm -hmm. a series of events. And the question is, how can people help you in what you do? How can parents, teachers, leaders of mathematical circles, developers, uh, other journalists, uh, uh, there are a lot of people involved in this project, how can we all help you in your quest? Uh, help me personally or help me generally? What is well, um, in your project, in what you want to do, is what you want to accomplish, you personally as okay, well. But it's probably both personal and professional at this point now, right? Right. Well, what people can help me with is just to basically um, ha have conversations with me, let, tell me what they think, um, you know, be patient with my possibly ignorant questions, um, especially with my ignorant questions, because I may be asking them deliberately. Um, <laughs> uh, just to just sort of get this idea, I just, and also a big help, not just to me, but to anyone who has had, you know, concerns about mathematics or fears, is to basically not say to them, oh, well, you know, maybe you're not a math person, or maybe this isn't for you. Um, that's a massive thing that people can do for each other, is to not, you know, to not just dismiss somebody like that and say, oh, well, obviously you don't understand this because you're just never going to be good at it. And, you know, that's to me is completely the wrong attitude. I, just recently I did a story for Mental Floss on dyscalculia. And one thing that I found was very interesting when I talked to all these neuroscientists who are studying this is that they said to me that dyscalculia is obviously a, a real big challenge, but just because a person has dyscalculia does not mean that they cannot learn math. And, I mean, here you're talking about someone, I mean, dyscalculia, at least the way they define it, is someone who has a very difficult time telling quantities, has a very difficult time telling the difference, I mean, telling that three things are larger than one. I mean, and they count on their fingers. I mean, it's very, very, you know, the very depth, the deepest level of, the deepest ground of mathematics that they don't get. But even these individuals with the right help can do it. So to me, yeah, just to sort of divest yourself of the notion that math is impossible to learn, that it, it's always, it's possible, and we need to let people know that and not just keep it to ourselves or act like it's our special thing. I mean, 
it can still be your special thing. Just because I like math doesn't mean you can't have your special thing. You know? <laughs> so that's essentially it, yeah. So, so that's the big one. And on a more kind of how to level, so how can people find your wonderful questions and give you the sensitive answers? What are some good ways? Uh, well, them? you can find me on Twitter obviously um, <laughs> and you can find it through my website but um, essentially you know tag me on Twitter if you see something interesting about math that you think I might find interesting or you know I mean again the likelihood since I am I can be a bit scary that way is I'll probably be the one coming after you <laughs> or not after me I'll be I'll be approaching you um, so you know if you're up for talking about it great um, it just, but don't you know? Don't start telling me that you know people shouldn't learn math because blah blah blah. No, don't don't even go there. I don't even want to hear it. You know, just, just be be positive about the future of math and the importance of it and the fact that it should be for everyone. Um, and I, I, you know, I'll be more than happy to listen to everything you have to say. So yeah. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So um, it's 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 been a very interesting conversation and um, oh, I, I really I, I really love your project overall. That's why it's such an interesting conversation because I think this voice that you bring to to the con to, to the big talk, to the big, big conversation is needed and and uh, it uh, I'm sure it will be a wonderful book. Do you have a time frame for that or is it just uh, oh, too God, early it's to so Funny, a friend of mine um, who writes books as well, or well, she's actually published books. Um, was telling me, you know, she 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 got her project in uh, 2014, and um, she spent. Uh, no, sorry, no, no, I'm sorry. She got her project in 2013, and her book is coming out in 2016. And so it just tells you, I mean, how long these things go. Although. You know, this math conversation is not going to be over tomorrow by any means. So I got a little bit of time there, but. I'm hoping, I mean, if everything goes well, that you could see something, you know, 2017 maybe, 2018? I know it seems a long time, but um, that's the way publishing works. So I don't know what's going to happen. But if it all, you know, goes to hell in a handbasket, I, you know, I'm just going to go ahead and self-publish the whole thing, and then I can decide myself. But I just kind of want to go, you know, it's kind of, it's a challenge. You know, just like I took calculus, I kind of want to try to navigate the publishing world for the moment, see how it goes. So we, we'll we see, started but. we started the community publishing at Natural Math for people doing interesting things. So I am navigating that world as well as a oh, yeah, publisher, you know, you know. I guess, um, but also as an author. And so that's always interesting to hear. Uh, how it takes forever because people keep saying, people keep asking you, right? Like, when are you going to publish your book? And it's like, well, that's a very good question. <laughs> Hopefully, soon. Uh, well, uh, think there's so much going on. Yeah, yeah, I usually say there are 200 to 300 major variables involved in making the book, so it's complex, mathematically speaking. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. That was exactly. No, I'm hoping. I mean, this, it's actually. Thank you so much for having this conversation with me because. Um, I've been actually I've, I've been sort of uh, trying to clarify some points for myself, and, and this helps because I can I, the missions become a bit clearer. Thank you, I appreciate that. That's um, wonderful. So let, let us uh, let us uh, continue this. Uh, please stay in touch with the Natural Math and Math Future communities if we can do something sure, sure. for you. And uh, I am really looking forward. To to more of your writings and your research and revelations, you will get along the way. Thank you so much. Yes, actually, if I can just ask you just one quick thing. Um, I'm actually working. I, I'm I'm been I'm writing for a site called Noodle, which is all about education, and I'm doing a few pieces on math education for them, including, you know, how you can build a household of numbers and how you can keep your children from. Uh, forgetting all their math stuff during the summer. Um, so if anybody in your community can give any advice, I would love to include them in that story if that's possible. So maybe I, we can email each other. It's not a problem. But, oh, but it's me, one of those things where I'd be interested. Let me thank you again and stop the recording yeah. and um, yeah. let's see what happens. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Hold on. <laughs>